Nowadays, the idea of empire building conjures up images of huge towers of concrete in the downtown areas of our cities, monuments to the success of some great commercial enterprise. Back in the 1600s, the empire building that was going on in North America was also very commercial. But instead of vast expanses of concrete, it involved vast expanses of territory, which were being competed for by the French, the Dutch, and the English. But as far as Canada was concerned, the most important empire builder of all during this period was not a European power, it was a native power. The Iroquois Confederacy, or League of Five Nations. In the first half of the 1600s, the Iroquois began a very aggressive expansion of their traditional hunting grounds. Why? What drove them to try to gain control over more territory? By the 1640s, this was becoming a familiar scene in northeastern North America, the exchange of European guns for Indian furs. Transactions like this took place both between the French and their Algonquian and Huron allies, and between their fur trading rivals, the Dutch and the Iroquois. But since the French would only give guns to Indians who had converted to Catholicism, they handed over far fewer firearms than did the Dutch traders, whose sole interest was commercial gain. It was these high-quality muskets from the Netherlands that were to lead the already very warlike Iroquois to redouble their attacks on the Huron, to the point where they became determined to destroy them altogether. This wasn't simply because guns strengthened the confidence of the Iroquois, it was also because their increasing dependence on these weapons, as well as on other European goods, meant that they had to keep looking for more and more furs to give to the Dutch in return. Within a few years, the Iroquois territory, in what is now the northern part of New York State, had hardly any beavers left at all. The best alternative source of supply was the region to the north of the Great Lakes that lies in present-day northern Ontario. But the consignments of furs coming down from this area were controlled by the Huron, who acted as middlemen between the native trappers in the north and the French traders on the St. Lawrence. If the Iroquois were to divert the flow of pelts from the French to the Dutch, they would first have to eliminate the Huron. Ironically, it was the French themselves who would help the Iroquois to do this. Jesuit missions such as St. Marie among the Hurons which were designed to bring salvation to the native peoples, also brought death. Although smallpox and other old world diseases fatal to the Indians spread even among tribes where there were no missionaries, the more closely the Jesuits' evangelical work brought them to the Hurons, the greater the risk of infection. So much so that baptism virtually became a death warrant. In the space of six years, between 1634 and 1640, nearly half of the entire Huron population were wiped out by epidemics. As more than 12,000 Hurons died, many of their relatives began to suspect that the sacred rituals of the black robes were a deadly form of witchcraft, and they became even more mistrustful as they saw the Jesuits' teachings creating divisions within the Huron nation. Some of the Huron leaders even plotted to assassinate the Jesuit sorcerers. But in 1649, the Iroquois saved them the trouble when they launched a massive attack on Huronia which resulted in the almost complete destruction of what was left of the Huron nation. Those who weren't killed or taken prisoner by the invading Iroquois were scattered among neighboring tribes. Only a few hundred Huron managed to preserve a separate existence, some of them retreating to the upper Great Lakes, 
others finding a refuge among the French at Quebec. But the Iroquois not only dispersed the Huron, along with most of their Indian neighbors, they also put paid to the Jesuit missions in southern Ontario, killing several of the Jesuit priests in the process. Two of their victims, Gabriel Lelmont and Jean de Brebeuf, were tortured to death and have since become celebrated martyrs of the Catholic Church. Although it's no accident that the most merciless of their tormentors were not the Iroquois themselves, but some of their newly acquired Huron prisoners of war, taking their revenge for the misfortunes they felt the Jesuits had brought to Huronia. The Iroquois invasion of southern Ontario in 1649 put an end to the evangelism of the French Jesuits in Huronia. They'd lost all their missions and almost all of their potential new Christians, the Hurons themselves. And the Iroquois had now acquired a great deal of additional power. Economic power in terms of the rich sources of fur they were now free to exploit to the north of the Great Lakes, and military power in terms of all the new recruits to their ranks, represented by the many hundreds of Hurons, they had taken prisoner. But what were the consequences of all this for Canada itself, which still only consisted of the little French colony on the St. Lawrence? How did the ascendancy of the Iroquois affect the core of New France? The Iroquois had been on the offensive for a number of years before their destruction of Huronia. Their clashes with French colonists from the St. Lawrence Valley dated all the way back to the Battle of Lake Champlain in 1609. By the 1640s, the Iroquois were becoming increasingly militant, and the outskirts of the French fur trading posts on the St. Lawrence were the target of frequent hit-and-run raids. But after they had crushed the Hurons, the Iroquois were able to concentrate even more of their forces on the French and their Indian allies in Canada. Their aim was to intimidate the French into trading with them rather than with the local Indians on the St. Lawrence. Although this mainly involved plundering native shipments of furs, there were a number of French casualties as well. Between 1640 and the early 1660s, Nearly 200 French settlers were either killed or captured by the Iroquois. This was a truly nightmarish period for New France, especially at Ville-Marie, which was the closest of the French settlements to the Iroquois. Maisonneuve and his colonists, both male and female, fought with great courage, backed up by such valiant women as Jeanne Moss, who tended the wounded, and Marguerite Bourgeois, who managed to organize an education for both French and Indian girls at Montreal while under an almost continuous state of siege. But in spite of all these efforts, the future of French Canada seemed extremely bleak at this point. Although, like the Huron, the Iroquois had been very hard hit by European diseases, there were still at least 15,000 of them, dwarfing the French population on the St. Lawrence which even by the beginning of the 1660s was still only about 3,000. To make matters even worse, now that the Iroquois had shattered the Huron fur trading network, the flow of furs from the Northwest, the very lifeblood of the colony, had been reduced to a trickle. Although the Iroquois still hoped to coerce the French into becoming their trading partners, and therefore had no intention of wiping New France off the map, at times, it certainly looked to the colonists as if their days were numbered. One famous incident highlights this fear. In 1660, a small group of Frenchmen, led by a young soldier by the name of Dollard des Ormonds, joined forces with a group of Hurons from Quebec to try to turn the tables on the Iroquois by plundering their furs for a change as they came down the Ottawa River. Unfortunately, Dollar ran into an army of some 700 Iroquois warriors, whom it was assumed were on their way to attack Montreal. Dollar made a heroic stand, but he and all of the other Frenchmen were killed, and the Hurons taken prisoner. The Iroquois then turned back the way they had come. 
The colonists at Montreal believed they had been saved from certain destruction. But it seems that all the Iroquois intended on this occasion was to kill or capture as many Hurons as possible. Nonetheless, the raids on the St. Lawrence soon resumed. And in the early years of the 1660s, it looked very much as if the history of Canada was about to come to an end. The French colony of Canada had been founded in 1608 with the establishment of Quebec. Then came Trois-Rivières in 1634 and Ville-Marie in 1642. At the same time, the Jesuits had set up several French outposts in Ontario. But by 1650, these had all been destroyed in the wake of the Iroquois invasion. By the beginning of the 1660s, with the Iroquois blockading its first supply and terrorizing its settlers, it seemed that French Canada was already on its last legs after only about 50 years of existence. What saved it? How did Canada manage to survive the hostility of the Iroquois? If there was a single savior of Canada in the latter half of the 1600s, it was this man. Louis XIV, who took over personal rule of France in 1661. France was by now reaching the peak of her power and was by far the most populous country in Western Europe with a huge army, which gave her mastery over nearly all her European rivals. The new monarch riding the crest of this wave made such a dazzling impression on his contemporaries that he was dubbed the Sun King. Louis was determined to extend his personal rule over every inch of the expanding French Empire, which now included rich sugar plantations in the West Indies, on such islands as Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Saint-Domingue, which has since become known as Haiti as well as the comparatively much poorer fur trading region of New France itself, which encompassed not only Canada on the St. Lawrence, but also several small communities in Acadia, plus a fishing base on the coast of Newfoundland. In 1663, Louis XIV declared all of this northern region, plus the Great Lakes, and anywhere else his subjects might wander in North America, to be a royal colony which from now on would be ruled by His Majesty himself. Now that Canada was tucked under the wing of one of the most powerful monarchs in all of history, there was a direct solution to its harassment by the Iroquois. The king sent over a thousand soldiers from his crack Carignan Salier regiment, who marched into the Iroquois territory and laid waste to villages and farmlands so ruthlessly that the chiefs negotiated a peace settlement with the French. For the time being at least, New France was safe from Indian attacks. But Louis XIV aimed to do more than keep the Iroquois at bay through his extremely able right-hand man, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. He resolved to make his North American colony self-supporting. To this end, Colbert appointed a business manager or intendant for New France, Jean Talon, who tried to work wonders for the colony. He encouraged the development of a small shipbuilding industry, as well as growth in the fisheries, in ironworking, and in agriculture. But all of this development required a lot more colonists to keep it going. And under the Colbert Talon regime, the population of New France was boosted from about 3,000 in 1665 to over 6,000 by 1672 and had reached 10,000 by 1680. This was achieved by various means, by persuading about 400 of the Carignan Salier soldiers to remain in Canada and settle down as farmers by heavily subsidizing immigration, but above all, by addressing the colony's biggest population problem, the shortage of women to bear children. Until the intervention of Louis XIV, everything in New France had been based on the fur trade, which was run by men. 
so there were relatively few females around. This is where Les Filles du Roi, literally the king's daughters, come to the rescue. During his tour of duty in Canada, Talon brought several hundred girls of marriageable age from France, many of them orphans or the daughters of parents who had fallen on hard times. Virtually all of these filles du roi were to find husbands very quickly and to produce an exceptionally large number of children, encouraged by a system of substantial rewards for families with more than 10 offspring. So this is how the Sun King, via Colbert and Jean Talon, saved New France. Not only from the Iroquois by sending over an army of young men, but also from a severe population problem by sending over an army of young women. Things certainly appeared to be looking up for Canada after Louis XIV transformed New France into a royal colony in 1663. Jean Talon had promoted a certain amount of agricultural and industrial development. The population was increasing rapidly, and the Iroquois menace seemed to have been averted, for the moment anyway. But in spite of Talon's efforts to diversify the economy, New France's main source of income was still the fur trade. And it was this same fur trade that was to create a new threat to French Canada towards the end of the 1660s, this time from the north. What was this new threat? The most vivid symbol of the trouble that was brewing to the north of New France in the late 1660s was this boat, which sailed into Hudson Bay in the autumn of 1668 on the way to a rendezvous with Indian fur trappers. This vessel had an English name, the Nonsuch, and she was flying an English flag. But the instigators of the whole expedition were two Frenchmen named Radisson and Grosselier. Their story goes back to the 1650s, when the flow of fur to Canada on the St. Lawrence was being obstructed by the Iroquois. This, combined with other financial losses, had brought the official business of the fur trading company that was managing Canada at the time to a grinding halt but it had also created a golden opportunity for some of the more enterprising of the colony's young men to do some unofficial fur trading of their own by dealing directly with the northern fur trappers. These freelance fur merchants who began to range the woods on their own account were to become known as wood rangers or coureurs de bois. By the end of the 1650s, two of these coureurs de bois Chouard de Grossier and his partner Pierre Esprit Radisson were doing a roaring trade with the native peoples in the Lake Superior region, who supplied them with particularly lustrous beaver pelts. These furs had come from the Cree Indians, whose hunting grounds were said to be by the shores of a great saltwater sea to the north. This was in fact Hudson Bay, first visited by Henry Hudson in 1610, but as yet unexploited by the Europeans. But now, it suddenly dawned on Ratisson and Grosselier that it would be much easier for French ships to sail directly into this northern sea to pick up their furs than to take them laboriously by canoe all the way down to the St. Lawrence through territory exposed to Iroquois attack. So in 1660, the two adventurers returned to Quebec not only with numerous canoe loads of rich furs, but also with their Hudson Bay plan for a shortcut to the Great Lakes fur country. This is when the fur trading powers that be in French Canada made a decision that would affect the entire subsequent history of New France. Instead of rewarding Radisson and Grosselier for having saved the season's fur trade, they not only arrested them when they refused to pay a tax on their cargo, but also chose to ignore their Hudson Bay plan altogether. A few years later, in 1665, this was to lead the two men to look to England to sponsor their project. Their timing was perfect. The previous year in North America, the English, who for some time had had designs on New Netherland, 
finally took complete control of this relatively weak Dutch colony, renaming Fort Orange at the head of the Hudson River, Albany, and the Dutch town of New Amsterdam at the other end of the river, New York. In the process, the English had also taken over the fur trade the Dutch had been carrying on with their Iroquois partners. But this trade was to suffer a setback with the carignan salière suppression of the Iroquois. So the fur merchants back in England were now anxious to find a way to outflank the French in order to get direct access to the pelts north of the Great Lakes. They therefore listened with great interest to Radisson and Grosellier's plan. The King of England, Charles II, who was tempted by what seemed to be an inexpensive way to extend English influence in North America, agreed to back the idea. And this is what led the Nonsuch into the Hudson Bay in 1668 with Grosellier on board. The expedition was a great success and returned to England with such a bounty of furs that in 1670, the King issued a royal charter to a group of merchants and aristocrats headed by his cousin, Prince Rupert. In this extremely generous document, Charles II gave Rupert and his Hudson's Bay Company the sole trade and commerce in the regions whose waters emptied into Hudson Bay, a vast area that England could have fitted into 30 times over and which was to become known as Rupert's Land. In one of history's great ironies, thanks to the initiative of two Frenchmen, Henceforth, New France would be facing competition from two groups of Englishmen, centered on the Hudson River in the south, and now also on the Hudson Bay in the north. The establishment of the Hudson's Bay Company, combined with the English takeover of New Netherland, posed a real problem for New France. The Iroquois' new allies on the Hudson River were potentially much more powerful than the Dutch had been, if only because of the rapid growth of the English colonies in North America. So even though French Canada was now under the wing of Louis XIV, there was a greater danger than ever of economic penetration of its fur trading territory from the south. And in the north, the Hudson's Bay Company threatened to siphon off more and more furs from the upper Great Lakes region. How did New France respond to the presence of the English in both the Hudson Valley and Hudson Bay? We can still find evidence today of how the French reacted to the English pincer movement that threatened their fur trade back in the late 1600s by taking a stroll down these picturesque streets. This is the section of New Orleans known as the Old Quarter, Le Vieux Carré, a reminder of the French heritage of what is now the largest city in the state of Louisiana. In fact, both Louisiana and New Orleans were founded by Frenchmen who had come here all the way from Canada via the Mississippi. Their reasons for doing so were related to the French-English rivalry for the fur trade that was starting to intensify in the 1670s. It was only by penetrating deeper into North America that the French could hope to keep ahead of their English competitors. One man who was particularly vigorous in promoting the expansion of New France was a soldier and nobleman by the name of Count Frontenac, who became governor of the colony in 1672. To make sure that the fur trade stayed in French hands, Frontenac put on a show of strength on the shores of Lake Ontario by arranging several days of ceremonial meetings with the Iroquois leaders. While the talks were going on, Frontenac had his men build the palisades of a wooden fort all around them, a miracle of quick construction which suitably impressed the Indians. This Fort Frontenac was actually the foundation of what would eventually develop into the city of Kingston. But for the time being, its wooden walls were enough to protect the local Algonquian traders from Iroquois attack. Meanwhile, further west, hundreds of Courier du Bois were now operating their own independent fur trading businesses. 
Although many of the colonial leaders back in Montreal and Quebec strongly disapproved of this free enterprise, Frontenac himself was all in favor of it and did everything he could to encourage the opening up of new trade areas. Two notable adventurers of this period were Louis Joliet and the Jesuit priest Father Marquette, who in 1673 journeyed to Green Bay on Lake Michigan, and then all the way to the upper waters of the Mississippi and down that great river as far as its junction with the Arkansas. But the most illustrious of Frontenac's protégés was a very complex character by the name of René Robert Cavalier de la Salle, who has been described as everything from a mentally unstable conman to one of North America's greatest explorers. Whatever his faults, La Salle was without doubt the man who did more to open up the interior of North America than anyone since Jacques Cartier. With the support of Frontenac, La Salle was involved in the development of a string of fortified French trading posts, which ranged from Fort Frontenac itself to Fort Niagara, Fort St. Joseph, Fort Crevecoeur, where Peoria, Illinois now stands, and Fort Prudhomme, where Memphis, Tennessee would be built. Then in 1682, La Salle carried on where Joliet and Marquette had left off and continued down the Mississippi all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Following up on Cartier's exploration of the St. Lawrence nearly 150 years earlier, La Salle had now completed the exploration of a second great passageway into the heart of North America, the Mississippi River Basin. This immense drainage system, the fifth largest in the world, was almost equal in size to the Hudson Bay Basin, which had so recently been claimed by the English. And La Salle was to make an equally extravagant claim to the Mississippi Basin, when in honor of Louis XIV, he named the entire area Louisiana and declared that henceforth it was part of New France. Now it was the turn of the French to threaten the expansion of the English in North America. If the presence of the English in the Hudson Valley and Hudson Bay hemmed in the French in the St. Lawrence Valley, the presence of the French in the Mississippi Valley barred the English from the interior of the continent. The lines were now drawn that would shape the destiny of North America. Mm -hmm. 